Okay, we've got a main purpose or a function question. Let's read the entire poem and try and understand what is it doing. And as we read it, let's just scan the answers quickly beforehand. Because every answer for these function, which is purpose question, always starts with a verb. Is it considering how the repetitiveness inherent in human life? Questioning whether activities completed at one time of the day are more memorable? refuting an idea about joy or demonstrating how individual experiences relate to communities. All right, that might help us as we read it. The following text is from the 1924 poem Cycle by Darcy McNichol, who was a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. No idea what those tribes are, but okay. There shall be new roads wending, a new beating of the drum. Men's eyes shall have fresh seeing. Gray lives reprise their span. Okay, confederated, what is this, 1921? Yeah, again, not sure what that is. Okay. But under the new sun's being, completing what night began, there'll be some backs bending, the same sad feet shall drum. When this night finds its ending, and day shall have come. So there are new roads being created, a new beating of the drum. So something new here is going on. Something's changing. Men's eyes shall have fresh seeing. Gray lies reprise their span. Okay, so something new and fresh in men is coming. But now we're contrasting. Under the new sun's being, completing what night began, so the new sun completes the night, whatever that night stands for, whatever it began. There'll be the same backs bending, the same sad feet shall drum, when this night finds its ending, and day shall have come. So basically the first part says there's going to be a new world, there's going to be fresh sights and everything. But truthfully, the new day... We'll just complete the night. It's going to be the same old thing that, you know, people will be overworked. Their feet will be sad. It's not going to be optimistic or favorable. So let's consider. To consider how the repetitiveness inherent in life can be both rewarding and challenging. So, okay, maybe the first part would be the rewarding. The second part would be the challenging and the day and the night, the repetitiveness? Maybe. Let's keep an eye on that. To question whether activities completed at one time of the day are more memorable. More memorable? It doesn't really talk about more memorable. This is a false comparison. That's not right. And I don't think it's literally a day and a night. I think it's just trying to say that there's this repetitiveness in life that keeps cycling back and forth. It's a figurative setup, I believe. Anyway, C, to refute the idea that joy is a more commonly experienced emotion than sadness. No. To refute the idea that joy, does it really say joy? Fresh seeing. New roads wending. That's not necessarily joy. And again, more commonly experienced? How do I know what's more commonly experienced? That doesn't seem right. That's again, looks like a false comparison. D, to demonstrate how the experiences of individuals relate to the experiences of their communities. Is the individual versus the community idea here? No, we start off with men and then backs bending. This really doesn't have anything to do with individuals versus communities. That's not right. I think it's to consider how the repetitiveness inherent in human life can be rewarding and challenging. The repetitiveness is the day turning into night. The rewarding is there's a new day with new possibilities and new sights. But the challenge is, well, after the night, the same thing's going to happen all over again. And it won't be as positive. I think that's what's going on. A. Okay, we want a function of the underlined sentence in the text as a whole. So let's read the whole text and then figure out what is the underlined section doing? What transitions is it leading up to? 
and we can quick check the verbs that always start these answer choices. It's urging contemporary musicians to adopt unique sounds. It's responding to criticism, offering examples of younger musicians, or contrasting something called keyboard fantasies. Okay. For his 1986 album, Keyboard Fantasies, Beverly Glenn Copeland wrote songs grounded in traditional soul and folk music. Okay. Then accompanied them with futuristic synthesizer arrangements featuring ambient sounds and complex rhythms. Okay, so this artist wrote songs that were traditional folk music and then added this futuristic stuff to it to make it sound much cooler or different. The result was so strange, so unprecedented, that the album attracted little attention when first released. And it's typically true of, you know, things that really are, you know, innovative they're not appreciated at first in recent years however a younger generation of musicians has embraced the stylistic experimentation of keyboard fantasies which is exactly what we talked above here right and alternative r&b musicians blood orange and moses sumney among other contemporary recording artists cite the album as an influence okay so what's the purpose here it's to show that there was this really unique style of music that added old with new and nobody liked it or it got little attention but today it's appreciated and a lot of popular artists cite it as their influence so is it urging contemporary musicians to adopt unique sound no it's not urging anything that's not right that's the wrong verb there's no call to action here b it responds to criticism no there's no criticism it's just it got little attention at first, right? It's actually the younger musicians who were positive or in favor of it. So this is factually wrong too. C, it offers examples of younger musicians whose work has been impacted. Well, it does do that. And that is the underlying sentence actually. So the purpose of the underlying sentence, it is to do that really. This looks good. Let's check the last part. It contrasts keyboard fantasies with the recordings of two. No, there's no contrast between two younger musicians and this keyboard fantasies work. C is the right answer. That's what the function of the underlying sentence is. Which choice best describes the overall structure of the text? Okay, so it looks like we've got, uh, you know, some text, not really, maybe a poem, kind of like a poem, possibly. And we want to know the function or the main purpose of this text or poem. Again, typical type of prompt we see in this section. So we have verbs. The speaker arguing against, interfering, presenting an account of efforts to dominate, providing examples of an admirable way of approaching nature, describing attempts to control nature. So I occasionally do this vertical scan of the verbs that begin. It doesn't give me the full sense of the answers but it does give me something to think about. Sometimes it helps, other times maybe not so much, but it doesn't really take much time to do in either case. Always we have to read the whole passage or poem, and let's go ahead and do that, figure out what is it doing. The following text is from Charlotte Perkin Gilman's 1910 poem, The Earth's Entail. No matter how we cultivate the land, taming the forest and the prairie free, no matter how we irrigate the sand, making the desert blossom at command. So basically, this is all about humans' impact or changing the environment so far. So it starts, no matter how we change the environment, we cultivate land, we tame the forest, we irrigate the sand, we make the desert bloom. No matter that, we must always leave the borders of the sea. And semicolon, I believe it's semicolon. Yeah, semicolon. So we've got a related idea in the next sentence. The immeasurable reaches of the windy wave wet beaches, the million mile long margin of the sea. So we can do anything to the land, the desert, the prairie, everything else, but we must leave the borders of the sea, that is the, the beaches basically, alone right something special about those beaches that we can't touch them or change them so all right let's see what answer the speaker argues against interfering with nature 
and then gives evidence supporting this interference. No, that's not it. That's not right. There's evidence supporting the interference before at the first part. So it's not, and then gives that evidence. That's wrong, even the wrong order. B, the speaker presents an account of efforts to dominate nature. Okay, yeah, we try to dominate. I don't know if dominate's too strong a word, but it is kind of, we dominate nature. And then cautions that such efforts are only temporary. No, nothing says anything about temporary or the time here. That's not right. C, the speaker provides examples of an admirable way of approaching nature and then challenges that approach. So an admiral cultivating, taming, irrigating, making, are those admirable? Nothing says they're admirable. And then, you know, saying we need to leave the sea alone is not necessarily challenging it either. Those aren't right. I hope he's the right answer. The speaker describes attempts to control nature. Yes, that's the first part. And then offers a reminder that not all nature is controllable. Yes, the borders to the sea are not controllable, right? We must leave those. D is your correct answer. Okay, main purpose. We want to know the function of the whole text. We're going to have to read the whole thing. Um, to convey, to establish, to reveal recognition, to emphasize. Let's go ahead and read. The following text is adapted from Sugimoto's 1925 memoir, A Daughter of the Samurai. As a young woman, Sugimoto moved from feudal Japan to the United States. So timing, this is pre-World War II. Um, this Japanese guy moved to the U.S. The standards of my own and my adopted country differed so widely in some ways, and my love for both lands was so sincere that sometimes I had an odd feeling of standing upon a cloud in space and gazing with measuring eyes upon two separate worlds. So he's closely attached to both countries, right? And he has some feelings for both of them. So he makes, he makes this comparison such that he's, he's looking at two separate worlds. And at first, I was continually trying to explain by Japanese standards all the queer things that came every day before my surprised eyes, semicolon, so related idea, for no one seemed to know the origin or significance of even the most familiar customs, nor why they existed and were followed. So he's trying to explain by Japanese standards the weird, probably American things. And no one, apparently not even himself, could explain those familiar customs or why they existed. So he lived in both worlds. He had this odd feeling that he looked at them. And in the one case, he, as a Japanese, could not even understand the American customs in many ways. So A, it's to convey the narrator's experience of observing and making sense of differences between two cultures she embraces. Yeah, she embraces both of them. This is about the narrator's experience in first person, and she's observing and trying to make sense of these differences between the cultures. This, this could be it. I'm going to hold on to this one. Let's check the others. To establish the narrator's hope of forming connections with new companions. Okay, typical not in passage. Nothing here about hope of making new connections. C. To reveal the narrator's recognition that she is hesitant to ask questions about certain aspects of culture. No. No. Just because she had some, ran into some queer things, she couldn't explain it, and no one else seemed to know. Well, if no one else seemed to know, she must have talked to them and questioned. So she definitely wasn't hesitant. This is just not the idea at all. D. To emphasize the narrator's wonder at discovering the physical distance, the physical, I mean, she did have some measure of wonder, I think, but the physical distance between the two countries, again, simply not in passage. The distance has nothing to do with it. It was all about the cultural distance or differences, not the physical distance. That's wrong. So, yeah, that's not correct. A is the correct answer. It's to convey the narrator's experience of observing, making sense of the differences in cultures she embraced. 
Okay, best describes overall structure of the text. Again, this is going to be kind of a mean purpose, a function question. Is the text outlining a debate, summarizing an argument? It's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Listing the literary characteristics common, presenting a philosophy, okay? Um, let's read. We gotta read the whole text to get the function, to understand the transitions and ideas here. So in the Here and Now storybook, educator Mitchell advanced the then controversial idea that books for very young children should imitate how they use language. Since toddlers who cannot yet grasp narrative or abstract ideas seek reassurance in verbal repetition and naming. Okay, so the books, her idea was that the books should imitate children and not use these complicated narratives or abstract ideas in adult text, but just show reassuring verbal repetition, right? The most enduring example of this idea is Margaret Wise Brown's picture book, Good Night Moon. Oh, I know that book. I love it. In which a young rabbit names the objects in his room as he drifts off to sleep. So very simple, nothing complicated. He's just repeating the names of objects he already knows in his own world, his own environment, which would arguably be understandable for a child. So this is an example. If we think about what this is, this is an example of the claim up above. Scholars note that the book's emphasis on repetition, rhythm, and nonsense rhyme speaks directly to Mitchell's influence. And it says, yes, this is an example of that. So, all right, the text, let's see the answers. The text outlines a debate between two authors. No, there are no two authors debating. Again, not in passage. The text summarizes an argument about how children's literature, there's not an argument, right? It was a controversial notion she had, but there's not an argument, okay? C, the text lists the literary characteristics that are common to many classics of children's literature. Where does it discuss other children's literature? Well, I mean, many characters, I guess we would say maybe it had narratives and abstract ideas in it, and then indicates the narrative subjects that are most appropriate. Most appropriate? That's definitely too extreme. How do I know something's the most appropriate? That's wrong. Well, guess what? I think it's going to be D. Let's read it. The text presents a philosophy about what material is most suitable for children's literature. That's exactly her idea, her controversial idea. It's repetition, rhyming, not complicated abstract ideas. And then it describes a book, a particular book, her book, Goodnight Moon, that was influenced by that philosophy. D is your answer.